Well, hello there and welcome to the Henry's Fort Caldera, the second youngest of all of Yellowstone's calderas and the second most re recent eruption here in eastern Idaho, looking at Highway 20 buzzing by folks going to Island Park, West Yellowstone, and then also south towards Ashton and other areas. Um, Thanks for joining me for this video. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey here exploring some of the geology and hoping to share with you some of the cool stories, show you the geology up close and personal. So what's I think somewhat lost a little bit in the narrative with Yellowstone is that um, they think, every, a lot of people think that the Yellowstone eruptions, the last three big ones, these super volcanic eruptions, all took place within Yellowstone National Park. And that's not the case. Here we are at the Island Park area in eastern Idaho, and this is actually the location, ground zero, if you will, for the second youngest eruption about 1.3 million years ago. Uh, but none of this took place, for the most part, inside Yellowstone National Park. It was largely just to the west of it. So let me show you a little bit of the lay of the land here, and then we'll explore a little bit. Um, Let's start with a map actually first that'll set set the context here a little bit. Um, so let's come down here and look at this graphic from um, my roadside geology book. So we actually have, here's uh, Ashton in Idaho. Here's the Wyoming-Idaho border. Um, here is Yellowstone National Park right here. And so what we have here with these three colors are the three most recent calderas or volcanoes that formed from the Yellowstone hotspot. And so, move it over here a little bit, that'll probably work a little better. Um, and so the most recent one is the Yellowstone caldera shown in yellow. So this is the eruption about 630,000 years ago, uh, ejected about 240 cubic miles of ash into the atmosphere. Uh, the smaller one over here where we're located, shown by the black dot here, the Henry's Fort Caldera, which is entirely in Idaho and outside of the National Park, is the second youngest. This took place 1.3 million years ago. And of these three caldera forming eruptions, this was the smallest, ejecting about 67 cubic miles of ash. Nonetheless, this thing was huge compared to something like Mount St. Helens, many times larger than the amount of ash Mount St. Helens produced. So while it was the three, it was the smallest of the three, it was still a very large eruption uh, in its own right. And then in the pink here, uh, which is somewhat uh, overprinted by the yellow and green calderas, the younger ones, this is the Island Park Park caldera 2.1 million years ago. This was the largest one. This one erupted about 600 cubic miles of ash into the atmosphere. So basically twice as big as the most recent Yellowstone eruption. Notice that the um, the Yellowstone, excuse me, the Island Park caldera and the Henry's Fort caldera somewhat overlap. The Henry's Fort caldera occupies more or less the southwest or the western part of the Island Park caldera. Similarly, the Yellowstone caldera, the most recent one, um, overprints at least part of the Island Park caldera shown here. So that sort of, sort of sets the stage for what took place here. Um, what I want to now do is turn to um, just a basic rundown of the sequence of events that take place whenever we get these big these big Yellowstone style eruptions. This should work well here. And again, these are also from the Roadside Geology book. So before we have an eruption, whether it's the 2.1 million year old um, uh, Island Park caldera, the Henry's Fork, or the Yellowstone caldera, what we see throughout the Snake River Plain and in Yellowstone is a similar sequence of events. The Yellowstone hotspot is fed by basaltic magma rising from deep within the earth. This is the hotspot itself. But as that basaltic magma rises and intrudes the crust of North America, it's running into 40 to 50 miles of mainly granitic-like rock. And that granite has a lot of quartz in it. It's a very different chemistry than the basalt itself. So as that hot basaltic magma um, interacts with the continental crust, it partially melts some of the continental crust. And what we end up with is a 
sort of zoned magma chamber with two different types of magma composition. Basaltic magma below because it's dense and heavier. And then sitting above that are rhyolitic magma. Now these two are quite different. Rhyolitic magma is high in silica. It tends to be lower temperature, thicker and pastier. And it tends to trap gases easier because it's, it's pastier. And so rhyolitic magma is usually associated with more um, explosive eruptions, while basaltic magma, like we see in Hawaii, or Yellowstone, is associated with more uh, innocuous, um, less explosive eruptions. So what we see initially is a domed topographic surface above this heat source. Notice the scale here. This thing may be 40 miles, you know, maybe about 60 kilometers across. Um, so we have an elevated region, just like Yellowstone today is elevated with respect to the topography that surrounds it. Um, Faults often develop along the margin of the magma chamber. These are sometimes called ring fractures. Uh, and those gases just tend to accumulate. So as the gases build and build and build, we eventually reach a point at which the gas pressure exceeds the, the rock above it. And that's when the eruption begins. So if we go to the second stage here, if we truly get a large eruption, of basalt, this could produce what we call a caldera forming eruption, where so much magma is just e exploded into the air in the form of ash that we empty portions of the magma chamber and the ground actually collapses in over that magma chamber forming a caldera. A caldera is a large, usually at least a mile in diameter, although in the case of Yellowstone, these are 40 miles across, so these are exceptionally large, but a large um, collapse area above above the magma chamber. Um, this is important to our to some of the story we're going to explore here today. So notice that the, the the vents are along these ring fractures here. That sends ash up into the sky. The ash will of course fall down uh, onto the topography, but it'll also produce pyroclastic flows that race down the outer flanks of the volcano and into the caldera as well. If we flip the paper over here, excuse me for a second, we can see what happens in the last few stages of the eruption. So now that we've had this huge uh, caldera forming eruption, these sort of super volcanic eruptions, if you will, oftentimes what we see is residual rhyolitic magma that's still in the subsurface. It's lost a lot of its gas, so it's lost a lot of its ability to generate explosive, uh, violent eruptions, but that rhyolitic magma may rise up and form lava domes. So these lava domes can form uh, either in the caldera or sometimes right along the caldera rim. Um, so we've got tuff over here or ash from the pyroclastic flow when we produce the caldera. But now we're producing uh, just these rhyolitic lava domes. And these will tend to be steep sided um, mountains or hills, if you will, within the caldera floor. Eventually though, since we've consumed so much of that continental crust early on, uh, eventually we reach a stage where the last gasp of these Yellowstone type volcanoes is for them to produce basaltic magma. So the basaltic magma can rise through that solidified rhyolite, which maybe at this point is formed granite or something like that. And that basalt can actually crack that solid rock, rise to the surface and start to fill in the caldera with basalt flows and maybe even form shield volcanoes. And here in the Henry's Fort caldera, we really see evidence for all of these stages of eruption. Even though this the big event took place 1.3 million years ago, we can see rhyolite domes along the caldera rim. And within the caldera here, just driving around along the highways, we see evidence for these basalt flows that are starting to fill in the caldera. So notice this last phase here, essentially and effectively starts to fill in the caldera and ultimately blanket the topography with this layer uh, of basalt here. So let's see if we can see a few of these things uh, just from the little parking area here. Um, so looking west towards Highway 20, we're actually looking as you look at the skyline here, which in places is a good thousand feet higher than we are and maybe like three to five miles away. We're looking at the western rim of the Henry's Fort Caldera. This is actually the best preserved caldera of Yellowstone's three most recent caldera forming eruptions. If you get on Google Earth, you can very easily trace, especially this western rim forms a nice semi-circular shape 
uh, at least back to the highway. As you come around this way to the east, uh, it's a little more obscured by more recent eruptions that have kind of uh, um, changed the topography. Um, but you can kind of get a sense for the size and the diameter of the Henry's Fort Caldera uh, in those locations. So what we'll do here is um, take you to a couple other sites, uh, either in or just outside the Henry's Fort Caldera to show you some of the geology up close and personal. But I thought we'd start with just this amazing view here. Some of these hills here, as we look towards the west, are actually rhyolite lava domes, like this one right above the two trucks here, just past the stop sign. Um, that's one of the rhyolite lava domes um, along the western margin of the caldera. So remember, that again, that's one of the stages of development we typically see with these types of Yellowstone Snake River Plain eruption types. So I'm gonna get back in the car and uh, head to a couple other stops and show you some of the other portions or outcrops here associated with the Henry's Fort Caldera here in Eastern Idaho. So here's one of our uh, classic caldera filling basalt flows, the last stage in our sort of Yellowstone uh, volcano evolution. This one's just right here on the Mesa Falls Scenic Byway Road. I'll uh, make sure I add to the video the age of this flow. I'm not sure exactly which flow this is, but I have a, a reference that'll help me out with the age and the name of this flow. But it's undoubtedly in the uh, tens of thousands of year range, maybe as old as a few hundred thousand years. Um, but yeah, nice classic basalt flow, lava that's poured out of vents in this region that's filling in the caldera here of the Henry's Fort caldera. Um, and in typical basalt fashion, we can see that the gas bubbles, the vesicles, are more numerous near the top uh, as you kind of head down to the lower sections of the outcrop, which is somewhat um, limited. You can see it's much more dense, so there's fewer vesicles uh, down here in this part of the lava flow. Um, yeah, so these are the uh, I wanted to show you just some of the examples here in the Henry's Fort Caldera of all four, for all the stages of the eruptive activity. And there was a nice road cut right here on the side of the road of these uh, basalt flows that have filled in the caldera. The other thing these basalt flows have done, which I'll feature in a video on Mesa Falls, is these have filled in some of the rivers and streams. So we have rivers and streams that, that have developed and are cutting through the caldera. And when these lava flows erupt, they tend to head for whatever is the lowest point locally, topographically, and that tends to be some of the river corridors or, or ponds or streams in the area. And so there's a really interesting history and evidence of basalt flows filling in some of these rivers, like the Henry's Fork River, damming it up, diverting it, um, then another lava flow diverting it again and sort of the, the river constantly changing its location and moving because of this ongoing battle between the lava and the water over the local real estate. So we'll head to another spot here in the Henry's Fort Caldera, Caldera and uh, show you some more of the geology. Okay, folks, here we are at a location just outside the Henry's Fort Caldera on its flank, uh, just above the town of Ashton, Idaho. And this little road cut in this neighborhood has a really great exposure and history of this Henry's Fort Caldera eruption about 1.3 million years ago. So let's walk through this outcrop together and see what we can figure out. Um, in looking at it, it looks like there's more or less three distinct units here. There's, maybe we'll back up to get the big picture here. There's a distinctly whitish unit down low that's uh, pretty eroded, but I dug a little pit out here so you could see it a little bit better, that's mostly ash. Then sitting above that is this somewhat creamy layered material here with these, these chunks of fist size and slightly larger rocks. And then that peach or pink colored layer um, grades into a more densely welded, more competent pink layer uh, that goes the whole length of the outcrop here, moving to, I guess, the southeast there. And so I think these three layers here, I think we can nicely summarize uh, part of the eruptive sequence of 
uh, the Henry's Fort Caldera from 1.3 million years ago. So let's start with, and let's actually get a little bit of context here. Um, going back to a, a graphic I used, uh, if you watch the, the Henry's, or excuse me, the Upper Mesa Falls video. Let me turn this way a little bit. And so, um, remember that when this thing erupted, there was already a caldera, caldera wall here from the 2.1 Huckleberry Ridge Tuff eruption, the Island Park caldera. So this caldera topographic boundary already existed. So as this ash uh, column collapsed and produced pyroclastic flows moving across the caldera floor, a lot of it got trapped behind the caldera wall and fused to form a very dense, resistant tuff that we see at Upper Mesa Falls, and that's um, showcased in another video. But some of it actually reached the rim of the caldera and poured down the flank, and that's essentially where we are right here, is on the outer flank of this caldera where uh, some of these, some of this pyroclastic material came down. So let's see if we can um, piece this together a little bit. And so our oldest deposit here, as we're looking at these layers, which are slightly tilted, to the south in keeping with the flank of the caldera, the outside flank of the caldera. It looks like we have this white layer uh, in the base here, which is somewhat poorly exposed, but you can definitely see a color change um, when you back up and look at this road cut. And this is all ash. So I dug a little pit out here uh, just below these larger blocks. And you can see it's dominantly ash sized material. Um, it's incredibly crystal rich. And I don't know how well the camera's picking that up, but there's uh, lots of pieces in here. In fact, going down to the road might make it a little better because if you look at the road, you can just see these, these little reflective pieces all over the place. And in fact, picking up some of this material here, it's dominated by crystals, mostly crystals of quartz, but I think there's also some potassium feldspar crystals in there as well. So this ash deposit, would represent the initial vent clearing phase of the eruption. So imagine the eruption commencing, all that ash going up into the atmosphere, and that ash starting to fall onto the landscape. So this is our sort of initial phase of the eruption. This is, this is when you knew it was going to be a rough day, is when the ash started falling out of the sky. And then the next layer above it, maybe the, the most exciting in some ways, is this ash or this layer with these blocks cemented somewhat loosely together. But as I pick these up, these are incredibly lightweight. Uh, and I've no doubt that most of these would float on water. If we break one open as best we can, let's see if we can get this baby open. It's pretty soft, not working well. I'm making a hole more than I'm breaking it open. But there we go, finally. Um, what we can see here are vesicles, gas bubbles, but they've been completely stretched out. So it looks like taffy. There's a, there's a left and right um, stretched fabric running through this piece. Um, also in here, if you catch some glints of shininess, there's some actually large uh, crystals in here as well. Those are the same crystals we see down here in the the ashfall deposit uh, and that tells us or that helps us without you know doing the geochemistry and the, the heavy lifting uh, that is a good indicator that it's probably from the same eruption we also don't see much of a of a break here right we go straight from the ash rich material right into the pumice just above so this would represent the eruption really getting going now we're throwing up uh, out of the vent the frothy gas rich magma that was sitting at the top of the magma chamber that's what this pumice indicates this is the super imagine like the uh you know you pour a glass of uh a root beer let's say and you've got that foam or that froth right on top because that's the where the least density material is that's essentially what this pumice represents is the frothy lava the gas rich lava right at the top of the magma chamber and we can see uh, that layer continuing uh, across here. Uh, we can see these blocks that go up to maybe, um, I don't know, football size or so. Um, easy to pick up. Look at my superhuman strength there, just with two fingers. 
and my amazing rock climbing grip, I can pick up these rocks. Why? Well, they're really light. They're incredibly light in weight because much of their mass is actually, um, is actually gas bubbles. So here's another one right here. Um, not too hard to pick that up and hold that with just a couple of fingers. So as we keep going upward into the next layer, so here's the top of the pumice layer more or less. And then it looks like the particles, the chunks of pumice, become a little less obvious or pronounced. And now the rock's becoming more fused together. We can see there's still some chunks of pumice embedded in this more massive and harder deposit here. Uh, and this continues again pretty much all the way to the end of the outcrop. So this represents the bulk of this road cut, this unit here. Pinkish um, grain size. Well, it's got these eroded or pieces of uh, pumice that have kind of eroded out. It still has the big crystals. I can still see some of these um, good size, with the sun here, good size uh, quartz crystals in here. Um, but mostly this material is ash, mostly ash that's been uh, compacted and somewhat welded a little bit. Again, it's not the hardest ash, but somewhat soft, but resistant enough. These would be the pyroclastic flows that actually stream down the flanks of the volcano. So these pyroclastic flows would have picked up and incorporated those pumice particles that fell out of the sky in our second layer here. They would have been entrained in these pyroclastic density currents or pyroclastic flows as they barreled across this landscape down the flank of the Henry's Fort Caldera. Um, high temperatures, maybe moving in excess of 100 miles an hour or so, who knows. Uh, and then all of that material eventually coming to a stop and based on its heat and thickness and compaction, more or less welding itself into a cohesive unit. As we work our way towards the other end of the road cut, again, moving up section, if you will, or into higher parts of this, uh, we can see not as many pumice particles. Uh, it's still about the same hardness. I can still see the crystals in it, but I'm not seeing the clasts or particles of pumice that I saw down lower. But really an instructive outcrop, really nicely details uh, the eruptive sequence from ash fall with the white ash at the far end, the pumice really clearing out the vent and erupting that frothy magma that probably was sitting at the top of the magma chamber, and then finally unleashing uh, the, the, the bulk of the ash, which would have been collapsing from the eruptive column, barreling across the landscape is this avalanche of pyroclastic material, and that forms most of the tuff we see here. So really great outcrop. Um, one of the places that's featured in my book, Geology Underfoot in Southern Idaho. I looked at a couple, a couple of other outcrops along the highway, which also show really nice outcrops of Mesa Falls Tuff, but it's a little bit noisier, a little steeper to get to. This one's very accessible. Um, you know, you're in, you're in a, as far as I know, a, a good accessible part here, just up ahead. It says private road, so I parked before. Uh, the private road sign but really nice outcrop just off highway 20 here looking at the mesa falls tuff the primary eruptive deposit from the second eruption or the second youngest eruption excuse me from the yellowstone volcano when it was in the yellowstone region 1.3 million years ago this eruption produced a caldera called the henry's fork caldera which produces a nice mostly circular uh, trace that you can see on Google Earth, but really well preserved. Excellent detail here in the volcanic stratigraphy. So hopefully you enjoyed exploring a little bit here. Maybe you can come here on your own. Uh, appreciate your support, appreciate your viewership. Um, please like, share, subscribe, do all those fun things. And we'll see you next time from another fun place here with Sean Wilsey, geology professor, uh, checking out rocks and explaining them.